Flat Feet, Wikipedia Audio Flat feet is a postural deformity in which the arches of the foot collapse, with the entire sole of the foot coming into complete or near-complete contact with the ground. An estimated 20-30% of the general population have an arch that simply never develops in one or both feet. There is a functional relationship between the structure of the arch of the foot and the biomechanics of the lower leg. The arch provides an elastic, springy connection between the forefoot and the hind foot. This association safeguards so that a majority of the forces incurred during weight bearing of the foot can be dissipated before the force reaches the long bones of the leg and thigh. In Pes planus, the head of the talus bone is displaced medially and distal from the navicular. As a result, the plantar calcanean avicular ligament and the tendon of the tibialis posterior muscle are stretched, so much so that the individual with pes planus loses the function of the medial longitudinal arch. If the MLA is absent or non-functional in both the seated and standing positions, the individual has rigid flat foot. If the MLA is present and functional while the individual is sitting or standing up on their toes, but this arch disappears when assuming a foot flat stance, the individual has supple flat foot. This latter condition can be correctable with well fitting arch supports. Children Three studies of military recruits have shown no evidence of later increased injury or foot problems due to flat feet, in a population of people who reach military service age without prior foot problems. However, these studies cannot be used to judge possible future damage from this condition when diagnosed at younger ages. They also cannot be applied to persons whose flat feet are associated with foot symptoms, or certain symptoms in other parts of the body possibly referable to the foot. Studies have shown children and adolescents with flat feet are a common occurrence. The human arch develops in infancy and early childhood as part of normal muscle, tendon, ligament, and bone growth. Flat arches in children usually become high arches as the child progresses through adolescence and into adulthood. Children with flat feet are at a higher risk of developing knee, hip, and back pain. A recent randomized controlled trial found no evidence for the efficacy of treatment of flat feet in children either from expensive prescribed orthotics i.e. or less expensive over-the-counter orthotics. As a symptom itself, flat feet usually accompany genetic musculoskeletal conditions such as dyspraxia, ligamentous laxity, or hypermobility. Since children are unlikely to suspect or identify flat feet on their own, it is important for adult caregivers to check on this themselves. Besides visual inspection, caregivers should notice when a child's gait is abnormal. Children who complain about calf muscle pains, arch pain, or any other pains around the foot area may be developing or have developed flat feet. Lateral X-ray of a flat foot with C-sign, which is a bony bridge between the talar dome and sustentaculum tali, in combination with a prominent inferior border of the sustentaculum tali. This represents a talocalcaneal coalition, which is an abnormal connection between the talus and calcaneus, and is thought to cause the flat foot deformity in this case. Training of the feet Utilizing foot gymnastics and going barefoot on varying terrain, can facilitate the formation of arches during childhood, with a developed arch occurring for most by the age of 4 to 6 years. Ligament laxity is also among the factors known to be associated with flat feet. One medical study in India with a large sample size of children who had grown up wearing shoes and others going barefoot found that the longitudinal arches of the barefooters were generally strongest and highest as a group, 
and that flat feet were less common in children who had grown up wearing sandals or slippers than among those who had worn closed-toe shoes. Focusing on the influence of footwear on the prevalence of peas planus, the cross-sectional study performed on children noted that wearing shoes throughout early childhood can be detrimental to the development of a normal or a high medial longitudinal arch. The vulnerability for flat foot among shoe-wearing children increases if the child has an associated ligament laxity condition. The results of the study suggest that children be encouraged to play barefooted on various surfaces of terrain and that slippers and sandals are less harmful compared to closed-toe shoes. It appeared that closed-toe shoes greatly inhibited the development of the arch of the foot more so than slippers or sandals. This conclusion may be a result of the notion that intrinsic muscle activity of the arch is required to prevent slippers and sandals from falling off the child's foot. In children with few symptoms orthotics are not recommended. Flat feet can also develop as an adult due to injury, illness, unusual or prolonged stress to the foot, faulty biomechanics, or as part of the normal aging process. This is most common in women over 40 years of age. Known risk factors include obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Flat feet can also occur in pregnant women as a result of temporary changes, due to increased elastin during pregnancy. However, if developed by adulthood, flat feet generally remain flat permanently. If a youth or adult appears flat-footed while standing in a full-weight bearing position, but an arch appears when the person plantar flexes, or pulls the toes back with the rest of the foot flat on the floor, this condition is called flexible flat foot. This is not a true collapsed arch, as the medial longitudinal arch is still present and the windless mechanism still operates. This presentation is actually due to excessive pronation of the foot, although the term flat foot is still applicable as it is a somewhat generic term. Muscular training of the feet is helpful and will often result in increased arch height regardless of age. Research has shown that tendon specimens from people who suffer from adult acquired flat feet show evidence of increased activity of proteolytic enzymes. These enzymes can break down the constituents of the involved tendons and cause the foot arch to fall. In the future, these enzymes may become targets for new drug therapies. Many medical professionals can diagnose a flat foot by examining the patient standing or just looking at them. On going up onto tiptoe the deformity will correct when this is a flexible flat foot in a child with lax joints. Such correction is not seen in adults with a rigid flat foot. Diagnosis An easy and traditional home diagnosis is the wet footprint test, performed by wetting the feet in water and then standing on a smooth, level surface such as smooth concrete or thin cardboard or heavy paper. Usually, the more the sole of the foot that makes contact, the flatter the foot. In more extreme cases, known as a kinked flat foot, the entire inner edge of the footprint may actually bulge outward, where in a normal to high arch this part of the sole of the foot does not make contact with the ground at all. On plane radiography, flat feet can be diagnosed and graded by several measures, the most important in adults being the talonavicular coverage angle, the calcaneal pitch, and the Taylor first metatarsal angle. The talonavicular coverage angle is abnormally laterally rotated in flat feet. It is normally up to 7 degrees laterally rotated, so a greater rotation indicates flat feet. Radiographies generally need to be taken on weight-bearing feet in order to detect misalignment. Dorsoplantar projectional radiograph of the foot showing the measurement of the talonavicular coverage angle. Weight-bearing lateral x-ray showing the measurement of calcaneal pitch, 
which is an angle of the calcaneus and the inferior aspect of the foot, with different sources giving different reference points. A calcaneal pitch of less than 17 degrees or 18 degrees indicates flat feet. Same lateral X-ray showing the measurement of Miri's angle, which is the angle between the long axis of the talus and first metatarsal bone. An angle greater than 4 degrees convex downward is considered a flat foot, 15 degrees, 30 degrees moderate flat foot, and greater than 30 degrees severe flat foot. Most flexible flat feet are asymptomatic, and do not cause pain. In these cases, there is usually no cause for concern. Flat feet were formerly a physical health reason for service rejection in many militaries. However, three military studies on asymptomatic adults, suggest that persons with asymptomatic flat feet are at least as tolerant of foot stress as the population with various grades of arch. Asymptomatic flat feet are no longer a service disqualification in the U.S. military. In a study performed to analyze the activation of the dibialis posterior muscle in adults with pes planus, it was noted that the tendon of this muscle may be dysfunctional and lead to disabling weight-bearing symptoms associated with acquired flat foot deformity. The results of the study indicated that while barefoot, subjects activated additional lower leg muscles to complete an exercise that resisted foot adduction. However, when the same subjects performed the exercise while wearing arch-supporting orthotics and shoes, the tibialis posterior was selectively activated. Such discoveries suggest that the use of shoes with properly fitting, arch-supporting orthics will enhance selective activation of the tibialis posterior muscle thus, acting as an adequate treatment for the undesirable symptoms of pes planus. Treatment Adults Rigid flat foot, a condition where the sole of the foot is rigidly flat even when a person is not standing, often indicates a significant problem in the bones of the affected feet, and can cause pain in about a quarter of those affected. Other flat foot related conditions, such as various forms of tarsal coalition or an accessory navicular should be treated promptly usually by the very early teen years, before a child's bone structure firms up permanently as a young adult. Both tarsal coalition and an accessory navicular can be confirmed by X-ray. Rheumatoid arthritis can destroy tendons in the foot which can cause this condition, and untreated can result in deformity and early onset of osteoarthritis of the joint. Such a condition can cause severe pain and considerably reduced ability to walk, even with orthoses. Ankle fusion is usually recommended. Pathophysiology Diagnosis 2 Treatment 2 Athletic performance Military performance Treatment of flat feet may also be appropriate if there is associated foot or lower leg pain, or if the condition affects the knees or the lower back. Treatment may include using orthoses such as an arch support, foot gymnastics, or other exercises as recommended by a podiatrist slash orthodist or physical therapist. In cases of severe flat feet, Orthoses should be used through a gradual process to lessen discomfort. Over several weeks, slightly more material is added to the orthosis to raise the arch. These small changes allow the foot structure to adjust gradually, as well as giving the patient time to acclimatize to the sensation of wearing orthoses. Once prescribed, orthoses are generally worn for the rest of the patient's life. In some cases, surgery can provide lasting relief, and even create an arch where none existed before, it should be considered a last resort, as it is usually very time-consuming and costly. 
Throughout history flat feet were seen as a sign of low class and poor health, and high arches were seen as high class and full of vigor. Research has shown that the two distinctions are far from the case. The effects of flat feet fall under two categories, which are asymptomatic and symptomatic. Individuals with rigid flat feet tend to exhibit symptoms such as foot and knee tendinitis, and are recommended to consider surgical options when managing symptoms. Individuals with flexible flat generally exhibit asymptomatic effects in response to their flat feet. According to AAP News and Journal Gateway, being flexibly flat-footed does not impede athletic performance. It is generally assumed by running professionals that a person with flat feet tends to overpronate in the running form. However, some also assert that persons with flat feet may have an underpronating if they are not a neutral gait. With standard running shoes, these professionals claim, a person who overpronates in his or her running form may be more susceptible to shin splints, back problems, and tendinitis in the knee. Running in shoes with extra medial support or using special shoe inserts, orthoses, may help correct one's running form by reducing pronation and may reduce risk of injury. Studies analyzing the correlation between flat feet and physical injuries in soldiers have been inconclusive, but none suggests that flat feet are an impediment at least in soldiers who reached the age of military recruitment without prior foot problems. Instead, in this population, there is a suggestion of more injury in high-arched feet. A 2005 study of Royal Australian Air Force recruits that tracked the recruits over the course of their basic training found that neither flat feet nor high-arched feet had any impact on physical functioning, injury rates, or foot health. If anything, there was a tendency for those with flat feet to have fewer injuries. Another study of 295 Israel Defense Forces recruits found that those with high arches suffered almost four times as many stress fractures as those with the lowest arches. A later study of 449 U.S. Navy Special Warfare trainees found no significant difference in the incidence of stress fractures among sailors and marines with different arch heights. <laughs>